Father, <clears throat> we come to honor you this day, <clears throat> to humble ourselves before you and seek your will, to thank you for the many blessings that you have given us in this country. We come to acknowledge that you are the one that can heal our land if we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. We ask that you bless our country with your wisdom, your love, and your compassion. May we be a people who are seeking you and your plan for us. Lord, we ask for your blessings on our leaders. May these servants who are in positions of authority take that responsibility seriously and do their very best each day. May they realize their need for you and for your direction. May they seek your wisdom as they make decisions and may they follow your guidance. May they have a passion for people, for truth, and for righteousness. Lord, we pray your hand of protection on all the men and women who serve in our armed forces, both here and around the world. Lord, we give you thanks for their service and sacrifice in keeping our nation safe. We pray that you would keep them safe and watch over their loved ones while they serve. Lord God, we give you thanks for this great country for the gift of life, for our liberty and our freedom to worship you. Lord, may we bring honor and glory in all that we do to you. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Um, I've chosen to read from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 48 to 52. That very day the Lord spoke to Moses, ascend these heights of Abarim to Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab facing Jericho. The view of the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites as their holding. You shall die on the mountain that you are to ascend, and shall be gathered to your kin as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his kin. For you both broke faith with me among the Israelite people at the waters of Maribeth Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin by failing to uphold my sanctity among the Israelite people. You may view the land from a distance, but you shall not enter it, the land that I am giving to the Israelite people. The foregoing verses are read in the synagogue on the, at Sabbath services as we complete the annual cycle of reading the entire five books of Moses, which are read in weekly segments consecutively. 
The single remaining section comprising the Torah, Zotabracha, is read on the holiday celebrating the conclusion of the reading of the Torah on the penultimate day of the Sukkot holiday. Some scholars believe that this reading is actually the first verses of the book of Joshua. The lesson taught by this reading is that of true leadership. Moses had led a long and eventful life, liberating the Israelites from Egypt and even personally communicating with God. While entry to Canaan is denied him, he is rewarded by seeing the promised land. Though Moses was undeniably a great leader, he could see in the distance, but not experience, the completion of his life's work. But this did not diminish his stature, stature as perhaps the greatest leader of our Old Testament history. Surely, with God's grace, he could have entered Canaan as Joshua was soon to do. Moses, more, well, more than 3,000 years later, another great leader, Dr. Martin Luther King invoked the imagery of Moses in his I Have a Dream speech and his vision from the mountaintop. He too saw the promise of the future and prophetically observed that he too would not see the realization of his life's work and just as Moses, he claimed the blessing of a vision of a promised land in which the equality of man is realized and all men and women are measured by the quality of their character and not the color of their skin or heritage. Amen. The selection I have shared teaches us a lesson well learned by Dr. King that as leaders we must not limit ourselves to goals attainable in our lifetime. As Moses could not attain the promised land, we are taught to act in the interest of our community with knowledge that we shall never see the mature fruit of our, of our efforts. We are also taught that the absence of a tangible success does not diminish the value of setting a goal, lofty goal, well knowing that it may not be reached during our tenure here on Earth. Another great leader, George, General George Washington, understood this lesson. After his election as our first president, he famously responded to letters received from the six colonial Hebrew congregations, Savannah and Newport writing independently, and New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, and Richmond writing a joint letter. How they ever expected to get six Hebrew congregations to agree? <laughs> the letters were actually initiated prior to Rhode Island's ratification of the Constitution and the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of religion that we all cherish so much. The letters were dispatched out of obvious concerns with respect to the Jews' status within the new, new nation. These letters were written nearly 200 years before Dr. King's good works. In his May 1789 response to the Savannah Congregation, President Washington, a man of abiding faith in God, concluded his reassuring letter to the Jews of Georgia with these words, which like Moses and Dr. King, provide a lens through which the lesson taught from today's reading. George Washington wrote, may the same wonder-working deity who long since delivered the Hebrews from their Egyptian oppressors planted them in the promised land, whose providential agency has lately been conspicuous in establishing these United States as an independent nation, still continue to water them with the dew of heaven and make the inhabitants of every denomination participate in the temporal and spiritual blessings of that people whose God is Jehovah. Signed, George Washington. May it be our prayer, therefore, that the leaders of our community be bathed in the dew of heaven, and may that dew water us with the vision to set lofty goals, the strength and wisdom to pursue them for the betterment of generations to come, and that we be blessed to understand that the pursuit of the promised land is our reward. Thank you.
Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, um, I have to tell you, judges by nature are very paranoid, so I, uh, I, uh, I, I tried to do some research, uh, and the fact that I'm, I'm following a biblical scholar and Ben Oster uh, it doesn't elevate my confidence level. <laughs> The, uh, so in researching it, I uh, came across very various commentaries. Some commentators have, subject, uh, have suggested that that judgment is is the prerogative of God alone, and uh, it's His final judgment that matters. Others have suggested that if uh, we are to judge others, we must as a minimum undertake considerable uh, self-introspection and think about our own faults and our own strengths and our own weaknesses before we pass judgment on others. And while I do not profess to have the insight of those uh, biblical scholars, the meaning and import of the passage, I do believe, and the lessons to be gleaned from it, have considerable broader application in today's world, and particularly in the current national environment, an environment marked by considerable ethnic, religious, and political prejudice and discord, and where the qualities of understanding, respect, tolerance, and compromise appear to have been brushed aside and relegated to the background, as if these qualities are a mere footnote to the manner in which we should be conducting our lives. Now, this may sound very odd, but on a personal level, the longer uh, I have presided as a judge, the less judgmental I have become. particularly about the beliefs, the actions of others. And, and that evolution uh, has transcended my formal duties. That is not to suggest, however, that that kind of evolution by necessity transcends to a lack of clarity in one's own beliefs and what is, what is to be considered truly important, it does not. It, it remains your faith, your family, and your community. The difficulty in passing judgment on others does not come, uh, at least in my view, from applying precedents or statutes. That's the easy part. The difficulty comes in analyzing and understanding the reasons why people say and do uh, what they do and the manner in which they conduct themselves, and to truly understand the underpinnings of their beliefs. People in many instances have preconceived notions about how the system works or doesn't work. And those preconceived notions are only amplified in many instances by uh, our ethnic and cultural differences. So what does that have to do with leadership? I guess what I'm saying this morning and the message I wanted to deliver is that with leadership comes responsibility, not superiority.
As leaders, it's our job to not only lead, but to lead in a manner that is fair and respectful to and tolerant of those who have entrusted us with that responsibility, regardless of their divergent views and beliefs. And from time to time, I think we need, as leaders, I think we need to be reminded of that responsibility. I just want to share with you a, just a brief story of something I personally encountered um, in, in one of my cases. The, it was a particularly contentious case, and it, uh, ultimately I, re, I resolved it. Uh, at times, uh, I have to be fairly firm. And I, I will tell you, although I bear no resemblance to uh, Solomon, his techniques are very effective when you're settling, <laughs> when you're settling a case. And, what, and the situation uh, that presented itself, it, the matter was resolved. And one of the attorneys said, to me, uh, said, Judge, my client would like to address the court, if you would. And uh, the client was uh, Middle Eastern descent. And it was obvious for me, from reviewing the case file and hearing some of the testimony, life had not treated him well and had not treated him fairly. He's, and so he says, Judge, I want you to know that as a person of color, I did not expect to be treated so fairly by someone such as you, a white Republican rich judge. <laughs> I said, there was dead silence in the courtroom, and the attorney uh, quickly went under the table. <laughs> and to break the silence, I said, well, sir, thank you very much. I plead guilty to being white and a Republican, but my children have pretty much resolved the, th the, th the third component. <laughs> and you know, it was, it was a source of some laughter afterwards, but, but as I continued to reflect on it, it's a serious, it's a serious issue, how we are perceived and it only underscores our responsibility of uh, leaders to ensure that people view what we do as fair and uh, considerate of their beliefs. And but being fair and respectful and tolerant, tolerant should not be construed and is not synonymous with agreement nor does agree agreement need to be viewed as being disrespectful, or disagreement need to be viewed as being disrespectful or intolerant. Reasonable people can and do differ on their funda fundamental beliefs, and, and their differences should be respected. It was an honor this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I just want to Thanks, Steve, for hosting this event, for the committee that worked so hard to put this on, and for you to be here with us uh, this morning. It's, real, it's a real honor to be here. Um, also, Larry mentioned the monthly prayer gathering. I'd love to see you there. Uh, it's a big crowd, but we'll find a way to get you in. <laughs> it's the Goshen Diner. We'd love to see you there. I think you really enjoy it. Um, let me begin this way. Um, we all have had times of great need. And uh, we prayed to God for help during those times. Whether we realize it or not, we're in, uh, we're in need all the time, not just for when things are hard, but also all the time, even from the moment we awake. Imagine what our county would look like if all of our leaders began each day praying and asking God for help to become better leaders and a greater blessing to the people they serve. So it's in that, amen. It's in that, uh, that spirit, that, that mindset, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in praying for our county leaders. Praise and glory to you, Lord God and Father. 
We love you, we thank you, and we desperately need you. The psalmist declares, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Yes, Lord, we need your presence and help in every area of our lives, the lives of our families, our towns, our communities, our cities, and our county. We ask specifically for all those who are in positions of leadership throughout this county, many of whom are with us this morning. They come from all segments of county leadership, both public and private, from government to community charities, from education to military, from first responders to churches, from medical providers to businesses, and many others. We pray for all these leaders and ask that you would grant them a humble heart to daily pray and seek your help to become better leaders and for the well-being of their people. Allow them to overflow with insight, wisdom, strength, courage, grace, compassion, civility, and a genuine love for the people they serve. May their work be a joy and not a burden, and may you multiply the fruit of their labor. Bless and protect their families who sacrifice so much in allowing them to serve. Gather around them good and faithful friends and co-workers to offer wise counsel and encouragement when most needed. Pour out your spirit into their hearts and the hearts of the people of this county that healing and renewal would flourish. May your will be done in and through our leaders and the people of this county. And when difficult times come, as they often do, may the hearts, may the hearts of our leaders not be dismayed, but may they always remember from where their help comes from. My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Father, may these prayers be pleasing in your sight. Receive them, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our key, keynote speaker for the morning is Leslie Haskin. Leslie is the youngest of 15 children. She was born to a Baptist minister. She grew up in Chicago's notorious South Side, but was surrounded by a healthy family life. Leslie came to New York City, where she quickly climbed the corporate ladder working at B-Trade, Michael Bloomer, Bloomberg's company, in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Leslie's life changed drastically on 9-11 when she not only lost 22 friends and developed PTSD, she lost everything she had, including her home. Today, after much struggle, Leslie is a New York Times best-selling author, a sought-after international key keynote speaker, and she most recently founded Life Station Center of Excellence. Leslie is currently writing a book, Radical on Racism, which will be released in September of 2018. And we are so very honored to have this ball of energy with us today. Thank you. So I want to talk this morning about the importance of leadership and how critical it is that we get that right. Years ago, I thought leadership was about being in charge. I thought it had to do with being the smartest person in the room and the loudest voice. And being a black woman, I thought it had to do with being strong and aggressive and intimidating. And then in the 8 o'clock hour, September 11th, my ideas of leadership changed when someone who also had an interesting definition or version of leadership interrupted the course of my dreams and my life with a 747 airplane. I was standing that morning at my assistant's desk. I walked in the office that morning all ready to fire somebody because we were having a problem with one of our major clients. And I was up the night before reading emails and trying to figure out what had happened and what went wrong and how I could save that client. I walked in that morning early, as I normally did, with my normal strut or swagger, as they call it. And I had my coffee and got my thoughts together and walked over to my assistant's desk and gave her the time signal, which was I pointed to my wrist, and which meant she had two minutes to explain what went wrong. And just as she opened her mouth, I could see her body starting to tremble. And at the same time, I heard this incredible noise and felt this unbelievable feeling in my feet and there was smoke and 
glass and furniture exploding all around me. I watched my assistant's body jump from her seat and start running towards the exit sign and I froze. I froze in front of a window that was open and I could see all of outside New York City and its grandeur and what I thought was success banging against the side of the building, including the bodies of some of my friends and a man that I thought I would marry. I was frozen. I couldn't move, I couldn't think. Someone grabbed me and I heard a lot of screaming and shouting and people saying the building was, was falling and I looked up and there was glass and, and fire already coming through the ceiling. When I look back, and sometimes I see the news clips and I watch the building from the outside, what you saw, and you saw the smoke and it looked from the outside as if there was just some smoke coming from the building and perhaps there would be survivors or perhaps the building would remain standing. But from the inside where we stood, we knew that building was gonna fall. You see, when that plane hit the building, that building tilted and it rocked and we felt it and it never righted itself. There was papers all over the place and I still remember the sounds of the screaming and the crying and the elevators and the people trapped in the elevators and we all crammed in the stairwell trying to get out. I remember the news report saying that everybody was calm. It's an interesting perspective. I think we were all in shock. I think we all knew that all of our dreams were ending that day in those stairwells. So I want to get into your heads for a minute, play a little game with you. I want you to imagine, for real, imagine that this is the last day of your life. And for the next 10 minutes, are the next 10 minutes of your life. I want you to really consider where we were that day. Just pretend that you're not going to leave this room. And in this society, how we're living today, it could be possible, right? We go to church and we don't go home. We go to the movies. We go to concerts, we go to school, and we don't make it home. So let's pretend that we've all come to this Orange County leadership breakfast and we're not going home. We were in that place on that day. And as we, each of us came to grips with that, walking down the stairs, shoved in. I saw a man, fireman, running up the stairs and leading people down the stairs. One woman in particular with the flesh just hanging from her body in shock. I saw another man standing when one of the doors opened and we thought perhaps it was an escape path for us. And I stood there looking at him, immobile. And it was a few minutes before I realized that he was not attached to his body. How can I tell you what happened on 9-11 without talking to you about what happened inside of me? and those who experienced it that day. I walked in that building that morning with an idea of what leadership was and I came out transformed. Amen. I came out with an understanding of what it means to be not in charge, but in a role where people look to you for answers and look to you for meaning and look to you for guidance. I look back and I 
I search the scriptures and I see how Jesus lived his life as a leader, as a servant, as a slave to us being willing to be broken and brutalized and taunted and laughed at so that we could have eternal life. And that's the position that we're all in today as leaders. We have to be willing to be laughed at and mocked and disagreed with for the sake of those whose life we're impacting every day. There's a saying that says we have to live our lives as if it's our last. I don't agree. Those planes changed me. You see, halfway out that building as we were walking through the concourse level, I was walking past a woman, and I'll paint a picture for you. Stay with me in this place that this is the last place that you will ever exist on this earth. I'm walking through the concourse level and there's a group of us and all around us there's fire and these little patches of people that are crying and terrorized because they're just shocked, they can't move. And we were being instructed to exit where the jumpers were. So outside of the broken glass, I could see all of the blood and the, the puddles of blood that we were walking through and some of the women had removed their shoes and I was looking at those spattered bodies outside of the concourse where we had to walk and there was a woman sitting there, I thought, and she was trying to pass me a note. And I paused for a moment and I recognized that she was burned very badly and she was shaking and she reached out to me with a note in her hand and as she reached for me, I reached for her and she passed away. And I heard her take her last breath and I watched her take her last breath. And it took away my voice and it took away my understanding and it took away my reason. My position in my company was the operations director. It was my job to decide and to determine and implement the strategic direction of one of the largest insurance companies in the country. I was taught by one of the most brilliant minds in Manhattan, Michael Bloomberg, and there I stood in front of this woman and I had nothing. I had nothing. Statistics say that during a, the course of our lives, one in five of the people that we come in contact with will pass away in our lifetime. So look around you and count how many people in this room are in their last days. And so here's why I disagree with living your life as if it's your last, because it's not our lives that matter. It's the life of the person sitting next to you. And it's the life of the person as leaders that you touch. It's the life judge of those people who stand before you looking for the grace of God in you. And this is the commission that he has given us. That as leaders, it is our responsibility not to be in charge, but to be vulnerable. It is our responsibility as leaders not to have all the answers, but to seek truth. It is not our responsibilities as leaders to be aggressive and bold, but to humble ourselves and pray and understand that the person that we encounter could be in their last days. You never know when your words are the last words that someone is going to hear. You never know when your position and your title and your touch is the last touch that someone will ever have. And so I beg you, as Psalm 90 says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Live your life not as if it's your last, but as if and knowing that it might be the last of the person that you are now encountering. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Uh, I, 
I just I'm going to make it as brief as possible. I want to first thank the committee. Uh, where's Dot, by the way? Dot and Mary Pat and the rest of our team up here. You know. Le Leslie and I were talking, you know, when we first did this three years ago, and, and I've said this in the past, so for the new people, this is for you, for the people that the, re the, uh, the, people, the repeats, uh, you're going to have to just deal with this. I, I think I got two, like, complaints. One was a legitimate one, and we took care of it. And the other one was, like, from, like, the president of Atheists of America saying, I don't like the prayer breakfast. Okay, we're not going to get that guy. So uh, I, I, I'll, t I'll lose that vote. It's okay. If it's, it's all right. Um, what I, what I really wanted to talk about today was, and I'm going to be very brief, a lot of people have alluded to talking about the national feeling. Um, you can't turn on any news station without the soul crushing what's wrong with America and what's horrible with this country and what's right, what's nothing is going right. We have no leadership from left to right. Everybody's fighting, they're not getting it done. And, and there's some truth to, to some of the things that are the challenges today and some of the uh, leadership challenges across the board. But uh, what I look at, and I've said in the past here, is the miracles that we have here in our community and the miracles that we could make happen with the people in this room. And I'm gonna give you a couple of them. I'm gonna start off with, uh, earlier this year I was invited to uh, a mosque <clears throat> in Orange County. Now I haven't been to a mosque in the United States ever. I've been to a mosque with the 4th Marine Division overseas. And it's a little bit different feeling when you're wearing fatigues with armored uh, troops than being invited willingly. So a lot of my staff like, you know, is this is not your type of comfort level, Steve. So I said, uh, let's give it a shot. So as a good naval officer, I bought my deputy county executive, who's a Marine. And uh, we went and, uh, and we did, uh, you know, we had a wonderful time. And they said, what are you going to talk about? I said, you know, I'm going to talk about not the stuff that divides us or what the difference is in our religions, because they knew I'm as Christian as you get. I talked about what, what, what brings us together. They're all, they're families, they love their kids. They love their wives, I hope, I think most people, no matter what you are. And we started a bond and we have a great relationship. These are part of our community that you can either continue to have these divides and issues or you can bring them to the table, break bread with them and start working together and make this community better. There's some, there's some major issues that we saw come here. In this particular mosque, one of their young gentlemen was radicalized and died fighting the United States in ISIS. And what we've done is we're starting to break bread and really break down these barriers to bring people together. And we're united by one thing, we're united by faith. The other thing I've, I've seen over the, the last couple of years as county executive, and we see this front line, Dave Hoover, the DA, we see uh, the opioid epidemic, huge, huge issue. And I see our deputy sheriffs here in the room and our law enforcement and our emergency responders get, get a godlike power by reviving people from overdoses. Literally, the people are dead, they're on their way out. And God has given them a second chance, sometimes third, fourth, or fifth we see, to straighten their lives out. And that's what this prayer breakfast is about. I see my running mate, Bill the Prosper here. He's gonna be a new, brand new county court judge. Tough spot. This is a tough job. These are the top criminal court judges. And there's a lot of other judges here too, and they're making tough decisions. He's gonna be working with Craig Brown and the rest of the team here. But he's gonna be able to make a decision on where people's lives go. Does he give them mercy to get treatment, to maybe try to straighten their life out and serve their Lord and become a better person? Tough jobs. That's what we pray for. We pray for people like you, Bill, myself, the sheriff who commands the law enforcement out there. And then I've also seen other miracles. We mentioned earlier, Larry talked about the marine plane crash that we lost 16 people, nine from around here, but uh, a number from down south as well. One of the widows is having a baby in a couple weeks. She lost her husband three months ago. I think it's three months ago, I can't count anymore. I did the budget, I'm fried with numbers. Um, she finds out a, a week after her husband's buried that she's pregnant. You talk about faith. And about a month and a half ago, Barbara, am I right or wrong? I don't know when it was, but about a month and a half ago, Barbara Allen, who lost her husband 12 years ago in Iraq, who we just talked about faith before, we came, before I came up on stage, she brought in about a dozen widows or um, Gold Star moms or Gold Star spouses. These, these people lost everything. And they had a retreat here in Harriman. and they, had a, uh, they rented a house. What a beautiful thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna support you on growing that, Barbara. It was a beautiful event, a two-day retreat 
where these um, women got together. Some of them lost their spouses over a decade ago. Some of them lost their spouse a few months ago, but they brought themselves together with faith and supporting themselves. How else do you get through life, through circumstances like that, without having faith? How does this young widow who's going to have a baby any day now get through life without faith? And you need that support. And the last, and, and Mary Pat told me two things. She said, keep it positive, because I do sometimes go negative. And she also told me not to cuss. And, 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 uh, and, and, when, and when Benny Oster was up here speaking, he had to go to court. I promised him that he'd get to federal court. He's got a trial today. But when Ben Oster was starting to quote famous people, he said, General George, I'm like, my God, he's going to quote Patton. We're going to have some cussing today. I'm a Navy guy, and I got flanked from the Air Force on the right and the Army to my left. But uh, he went with George Washington. So the other thing, she told me no cussing, and she said to keep it positive. But in the last two days, we had two suicides in Orange County. One was from a middle-aged person, and one was from a young, young person yesterday. And one of the things we do, and I see Honor, and I see my health care providers, Linda Muller, and all this stuff, they said one of the leading ways to prevent somebody from committing suicide is not to have his family say, I love you, hey, are you okay? It's from a complete stranger saying, good morning, good afternoon, how are you doing today? Somebody from out of the ordinary noticing you. When is the last time we've ever done that? And I'm, this is, look, this is a room of rock stars. My, my message to you is to continue to go out in our community and make a difference. We can't wait for Washington. We can't wait for Albany. We can make, the, we can make change here. One of the things Leslie asked, asked me, she goes, as county exec, can you, can you make a decision like that impacts the people directly? I look at Chris Molinelli from Honor. We, if you see a homeless man or woman right now pulling out of here, you can call them and they can come and bring that man or woman and get them new, a, a warm bed, a new set of clothes and food. I've seen it happen. As we head, as, and there's mostly Christians and Jews in this room, and I think we got some Muslims as well. But as we head into the holy month for, uh, for Christmas and Hanukkah's coming up, there's, this is like the time of year where you raise money for food and you start talking about, this is a great time to start that trend. I hate it when it ends like in December 25th. Everybody's, all right, we'll pack it up. We don't have to do these things anymore. But this is a great opportunity for us to go out there and make a difference Amen. and change people's lives because I see it happening every day with the people that I work with. Um, I bring up this story all the time because it's one of the proudest things I've seen come happen in this community. And I talked to Leslie about it earlier. We have a number of safe houses in Orange County where we take care of young men and women. Uh, young, I'm talking like eight years old, sometimes 10 years old. They've been abused, They're, they've been sexually abused, they've been physically abused. I call their parents ninjas. No income, no job, no asset. They might not even be around. But the biggest thing that these group of kids have every day besides hanging out and building upon themselves, they, they, who's gonna be the lucky one that day to say the evening prayer? If it starts with them, we could definitely help them get to where they need to be. When I talk to fellow military members, when you're wearing that uniform, or you are a superhero, you're no less than Batman or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman to these kids. They're looking up to you. You can change their lives. And it goes for everybody in this room. There's nothing better than to have somebody else appear, go to somebody that needs help, and show them the way. I've seen it happen. So I want to thank everybody for being here today, for bringing us together. Uh, we're going to continue to do good things. If I need to do stuff that I'm not doing, let me know. I got an open door. People complain to me all the time. I married my, I told you, I got four kids. First thing in the morning, change the stinky diaper, dad. You're a rock star. The biggest mistake that happened to me when I was county executive, about two months after I come into office, Parenting Magazine puts me on the front cover. Dad of the year. They got myself, I had three kids then, on the front cover, and when they went to do the pictures, they told my wife, like, no, no, we don't need you in the picture. So I'm paying for it every day. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank everybody. I look forward. I see my legislators, Jimmy O'Donnell and, and uh, Tom Fascione. We're going to continue to work for you, but uh, I appreciate the prayers, and I appreciate you for being here today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I don't have paper. I have a phone. <laughs> I first want to... Um, before I close, just thank Leslie for her beautiful message. Um, thank you. 
it did inspire me as, as leaders, as we all know, what we do is hard. It's not easy. And it is important to be vulnerable, and it's hard to be vulnerable. And I think a lot of that has to do that sometimes we do have this image of what a leader is supposed to be. Leaders don't cry. Leaders don't show weakness. But a true leader does cry. And our greatest leader was the Lord Jesus Christ, who cried for us. My, what I'm going to read to you right now is from Matthew. Um, Matthew 20, verse 27 through 28. For who, whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give life as a ransom for many. Our greatest leader on the night he was betrayed washed the feet of his apostles. He served them and then gave himself up. And that is who we need to be as leaders. We need to serve them and put ourselves last. No ego, no pride, no edification, but to him goes all the glory. Please join me in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, mighty God, that you have gathered all these people together, Lord, from all branch of government and schools and nonprofits, Lord Jesus. You know our hearts, you know our desires, Lord Jesus. I pray, mighty God, that you would use us as a vessel, that you would use us to serve, Lord, that when people interact with us, Lord, they may see you, Heavenly Father, that it be less of us and more of you, mighty God. We pray, Lord, that we understand that the greatest place in the world is kneeling at your feet. That we know that we kneel at your feet in times of trouble, Lord. And then most importantly, we kneel at your feet in times of triumph. For we know that when those victories come, it is not by our own strength, it is not by our own wisdom, Lord, but it is by your mighty hand, Heavenly Father. We pray, Lord, that you would keep us humble. We pray that you would keep us focused. We pray that our eyes will always stay on you and nothing else. May we not go left and right without your wisdom, without your direction, we, that we may always seek your counsel, Heavenly Father. We pray that you will lay your hand on every man and woman in this place, Heavenly Father. Search our hearts, give us new hearts, hearts of flesh, Heavenly Father, that we may be open to receive you, mighty God. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be together today, mighty Father. We lift up your name, and we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Saggy. Two assignments. Don't forget to fill out your card. Uh, that's the first assignment. Uh, come to next year's prayer breakfast and bring a friend. How's that? And then there's one huge assignment for today, for the rest of the day. Hope in the Lord and enjoy him now and forevermore. Amen.